Kısırı. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, we will begin shortly. All right, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa afdilu salati wa tamu taslim ala rasulihi al-kareem. Wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Wa ala ashabihi al-ghurri al-mayamin. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. Allahumma ja'ala minhum. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا متقبلا يا أرحم الراحمين. We begin as we always do by first and foremost praising Allah subhanahu wa taala, thanking Him, acknowledging that He is the only one worthy and deserving of all praise and thanks, and we ask Him to shower His most complete and abundant blessings and protection upon His noble Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Upon his noble family, upon his shining companions, and upon all of those that follow them until the end of time, and we ask Allah to include us from amongst them. We ask Allah to teach us what will benefit us, to benefit us through what He has taught us, and to increase us in knowledge and accepted actions. Amin. 
So assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, everyone. Thank you for tuning in for our Fiqh of Fasting webinar. Um, just some uh, preliminary matters that we wanted to mention. Um, there might be a lot of uh, questions that uh, might arise as we go through the uh, as we go through our presentation. So please do um, uh, put in the comment section uh, whatever questions you might have uh, during the seminar, and uh, we will be keeping an eye on the comment section as well. So uh, at the end of the entire thing, we will go through each and every single question and answer them. Uh, if possible, <laughs> yeah, we, we, HL, we should be able to, to get through all the questions. So that option is definitely there for any questions that you have. Please go ahead and put it in the comment uh, chat box. Um, as well, just another preliminary thing we wanted to mention, um, this seminar on fasting and actually the whole concept of fasting in Islam, this whole field is one in which there is so, so, so much uh, ijtihad that can be possible, meaning there's a lot of room for difference of opinion uh, when it comes to fasting. So we will be giving this presentation predominantly based on Hanafi, on Hanafi fiqh. Uh, however, um, there might be some things that you notice other people doing or not doing, uh, whatever it might be. So uh, just keep that in mind in the back of your head that um, there is a lot of room for difference of opinion when it comes to fasting. Uh, and whenever we uh, have a difference of opinion that comes up in the slides, we will definitely mention it uh, and bring that up. Uh, but uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, you know, why do we fast? Yes, Allah told us to fast. The Prophet Sallallahu told us to fast. Fasting is something that we know in the, is in the Quran. But why do we do it? What's the purpose of it? What's the benefit of it? And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. That believers, fasting has been made, has been mandated upon you it has been obligate, obligated upon you, just like it was mandated, prescribed, written for those people before you, so that you have taqwa, so that you have God consciousness, so that you realize and protect yourselves from the anger and punishment of Allah by doing what He tells you to do and staying away from what He tells you not to do. And this is the key highlighting principle that, you know, whenever we hear this, this, uh, this ayah being recited, the few days, the few weeks before Ramadan, it really just tingles, you know, our hearts. And few verses later, Allah He says, "Shahr Ramadan, الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان." And He continues on, but He says something so profound and so beautiful when He describes one, the Quran; two, guidance; three, fasting; and four, ease for us as believers. He says it was in the month of Ramadan, the month that we are about to enter, that the Quran was revealed in. And it's not just the Qur'an, but guidance for all of humanity. Clear messages that give guidance and distinguish between right and wrong so that we know what is correct and what not to do. And whoever is present in this month, whoever is here for this month, and you witness the month, then you should fast. And if someone is on, on, ill or on a journey, then they should make up for those days later. And then Allah, He ends by saying that He wants ease for you and He wants you to be a means of ease for others. And he wants you to complete the prescribed period, the, the number days, the number of days that are set to fast, and to glorify him, to declare his perfection, to declare his greatness for having guided you so that we are thankful, so that we show our true gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the key guiding principles that Allah tells us when he introduces the month of Ramadan to us. And so now going back to the initial question, why do we fast? And so if you see in the slide here, uh, there is a link to iftar.fyi, I-F-T-A-R.fyi. If you just go there, that is a, a brief uh, website that is something that I would recommend those of us who, you know, have uh, co-workers that may not be Muslim for us to just do a quick share about, hey, this is why I may be fast. This is why I'm fasting. This is what I do in the month of Ramadan. This is why it's significant. And for us as Muslims, right? We should ask ourselves, well, you know, why do I fast? Do I fast to lose weight? Do I fast to maybe gain weight? Do I fast to feel tired and hungry and exhausted? Do I fast to specifically sympathize with the homeless and the poor? 
Do I fast because I just really enjoy the fried foods and the amazing meals that I have at these fancy iftar parties? Is this the reason why we fast? And these are not the reasons why we fast. And like we mentioned at the beginning, Allah tells us why we should be fasting. He tells us, لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون, So that you can have the taqwa of Allah. You become more aware of, in more awe of, and truly obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah wants us to complete the prescribed period. The set days of 29 to 30 days of the month of Ramadan, He wants us to fulfill those days because He guided us to them so that we declare Allah's perfection and that we show our gratefulness and our appreciation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, now that we know why we fast, before we know when to fast, we have to know, is it the month of Ramadan yet? Is it the month of Ramadan? And so how do we determine the start of the month of Ramadan? And so what we know is that the month of Sha'ban, the month that we are currently in, this is the eighth month of the lunar calendar, the eighth month of the Hijri calendar that we as Muslims follow for our religious months. And the month of Sha'ban, just like any other month, can be either 29 days or 30 days. And once it's the 29th night and we look outside, we will look at the moon or go based off of calculation to know whether the new month has entered, whether the month of Ramadan has entered. And so we are expecting to see the crescent on the night of April 23rd. So that's next Thursday. That night we are expecting to see the crescent moon or based off calculation uh, and we will start praying Taraweeh next Thursday night and we'll be fasting that Friday. And I don't want to delve too much into, you know, should we go by, you know, moon sighting or should we go by our local calendars or, or about that just because I don't want, we don't want to focus on that specifically here today. Rather, the advice that we're going to give is go with the local masjid that you locally and regularly pray in. And this is not a time to, to argue and to fight and say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And we're not even going to be going to the masjid this year, right? So that should already break our hearts and is already breaking the hearts of our leadership. So don't add, you know, more injury to it. If your local masjid goes by calculation, but you feel that you want to go by moon sighting, okay, that's fine. Be patient or go pray at another masjid or start on your own at home. Or if your local masjid goes by moon sighting and you go by calculation, again, that's fine. Either be patient or stick to another masjid, but do not argue, do not criticize. These are valid opinions, and we should not be, you know, becoming rude or vile or calling people backwards or calling people anything mean or inappropriate. This is not the time for that. This is thing, these are things where our scholars have differed upon. Now, once we know that the month of Ramadan is in, now what are the actual rules of fasting? What breaks my fast? What doesn't break my fast? When do I intend to fast? All of the rules that are encapsulated within the actual fast itself. So when we talk about fasting, fasting like other actions has a specific timing and has a specific duration. For example, we all know the timing of Fajr. We all know the timing of Dhuhr. We all know that Hajj has specific dates. And so fasting too has specific dates. First and foremost, it's within the month of Ramadan for those 29 or 30 days in the month of Ramadan. And number two is the duration of the fast. The duration of the fast. Now, we as Muslims, we fast from dawn until sunset. We fast from when Fajr comes in until sunset when Maghrib comes in. We do not fast from sunrise to sunset. Sunrise to sunset would mean when Fajr ends, but we fast when Fajr starts. And the start time, uh, the easiest and probably the, the, this, this, the best thing we can recommend is to go with the Isna calculation. If any of you have um, you know, smartphones or you go online to look up what times that your prayer times come in, then go with the Isna calculation. Go with the Isna calculation, and that'll give you the 15 degree method for when uh, Fajr will come in and when Isha will come in. Now, the end time, as we said, is immediately when Maghrib enters, meaning don't wait until it's dark, because when the sun sets, there will still be light outside. 
And so for us at home, you know, use location-based timings, whether that's salah.com or Islamic Finder. Or if you live very close to the masjid or a community that gives out a, uh, a prayer sheet, then go by that. But for example, you know, you say you love IOK and who doesn't love IOK? But IOK is going to have their prayer charts based off the time in Diamond Bar. So if you live in Fontana or you live in Long Beach, you live too far for IOK's prayer time to even be relevant to you. So, so stick with what is close to you. If you live a few miles, a few minutes away from the masjid, then that would be okay. Or use uh, a prayer time that you have on your phone. Next is, okay, I know the timings of the fast. I go from before Fajr until Maghrib time. But now when am I supposed to make that intention? When am I supposed to make that intention? So the most strict and constricted way to look at this would be the earliest you can make an intention would be the maghrib from the night before. And a more lenient approach would be to, to be able to just kind of bulk intend for the entire month of Ramadan. So whether next Thursday comes and you say, I'm going to fast the whole month of Ramadan, and that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is your intention, then that would be okay. Or if you were to every night say, once maghrib has come and you say, okay, I intend to, to fast tomorrow, then that would also be okay. But now, what is the last time you can make the intention? What is the latest time you can make the intention where if you don't make an intention by this point, it's, not, it's, it's, it's like you don't, you're not fasting. And so there are four types of fasts wherein you have to make the fast before Fajr even enters. You have to make the intention to fast before Fajr even enters. That would be in the case of if you have to make up any fast from Ramadan or you want to do any, uh, you have any makeup fast that were nafil or you have any promises, any vows that you have made. In these scenarios, you should be making the fast, intention to fast before Fajr even comes in. Right, and, and, and this is not going to be the category that we're going to be seeing in the month of Ramadan, which that will be the next slide. So in this slide we see these type of fasts that you have to make the intention for either the night before or for the entire period, but you have the option to make the intention up until midday, up until the time from when Fajr comes in until Maghrib. So this would be for any fast wherein the intention of the fast and the day of the fast is the same. So in the month of Ramadan, you are in the month of Ramadan, and you're fasting a Ramadan fast, right? So in that case, you would fall under this category. And for whatever reason, for whatever circumstance, if you're worried and you don't want to make the fast from the, from the day before or the, the morning of, then you can go ahead and delay making the intention up until, up until midday, which would be the safest would be around one hour before Dhuhr. Or in a case where if you have any voluntary fast on any regular day. So in that circumstance, Right, you can make the intention up to an hour before Dhuhr. And that doesn't mean you can eat or drink before that time. It just means for whatever reason, if you want to restrain your intention up until that point. Okay, so the next topic that we are going to discuss, we discuss the intention, we discuss the timing. The next ruling that comes up when it uh, deals with fasting is who must fast? Who is fasting obligated upon? Who are people that during the month of Ramadan, it is an obligation, it is fadl, it is mandatory upon them to fast. So for someone to be have that obligation of fasting, they must fulfill each and every single one of these categories, each and every single one of these five conditions. If even a single one of these conditions is not present, then fasting is not obligated upon them. The first category is that they must be mature. They must be an adult. They must be what in Islam is legally considered to be an adult. And what that categorization is, is that the individual must have passed the age of puberty. For women, this is once they uh, have their menstrual cycle. And for men, this is once they experience a wet dream. And if neither of those happen uh, until a person is uh, for, uh, 14 year, uh, lunar months old and se 14 months old and seven months, uh, 14 years old and seven months, then that would count as their uh, adulthood. 
meaning that if a woman does not experience a menstrual cycle until she is 14 months and seven, seven, 14 years and seven months old, uh, then she will be considered an adult. If a man or a a uh, male does not experience a wet dream until he is 14 years and seven months old, then he would be considered an adult after that. So the first condition is that they, is that they must be uh, mature. They must be what is legally considered to be an adult in Islam. The second category is that they must be sane. They must have no mental defect that afflicts them to such a degree that they are not able to distinguish between right and wrong. They are not able to determine what's going on around them. Uh, they're not able to be uh, determine what's going on around them. They're simply uh, not there mentally. So the second category is that they must be sane. The third, the third category is that they must be a resident, meaning that they must be in their home. They must not be traveling. And even if they are in a place that is other than their home, then they must be staying in that place for 15 days or more. So not traveling, meaning you're at home, or if you're at a different place, even if it's outside of your locality, even if it's a different state or a different country, if someone is staying there for 15 or more days, then they are considered a quote unquote resident and they must fast. The fourth category is that they must be free from illness and specifically illness that will worsen if one fasts. So they must be healthy. They must have the physical capability of fasting that they don't have a chronic uh, illness that they uh, prevents them from fasting. And this also applies to pregnant or nursing women if there is a fear for the mother or child. And this fear is based on personal experience, whether a uh, woman has been pregnant in the past and she tried fasting and it didn't turn out well. If a woman was nursing in the past, tried fasting, it didn't turn out well. So it can be based on personal experience or if it's an individual's first time being pregnant or first time nursing and they don't have any experience on what it's like to fast and be in either one of those states, then they should go to a Muslim doctor that can advise them accordingly on whether because of their weight or their size or anything like that. If there's a legitimate fear that fasting will be detrimental for the mother or for the child, then they are also exempt from fasting. So being free from illness or being free from pregnant or nursing. The last category is that they must be free from any chronic in the inability, meaning any ongoing disability that prevents them from fasting, whether that's old age and a constant need to uh, have three meals a day or eat and drink, uh, you know, in, in regular intervals, whether it's a constant need to take pills and medication or any other uh, type of disability that would prevent someone from fasting for an extended chronic period of time. So um the people that are obligated to fast must fulfill each and every single one of their these categories if even one of them is missing then a person is not obligated to fast